I, I came up with this, I came up, I guess, with a new tagline um, for my business while I was there because it was such a good like mastermind collaborative um, brainstorm there. And in a life of fleeting moments, I get to make time stand still. And that's super powerful. Yes, it and is. it is really in a very selfish way validating. Like I feel I feel super honored and I feel very excited when I'm chosen to be the person that gets to document this day or the proposal or like whatever. And mind you, like I take it super seriously. I get really nervous, <laughs> especially with the proposals. Like my very first proposal, my knees were shaking for the for this guy. So, um it was, you know, it's I just take it super seriously and I'm super um, invested in each of the clients that I take on. Welcome to the Imani Experience Podcast. In this podcast, you will experience wisdom, advice, and stories from creatives all over the world. Your host is Imani Roberts, who is a DJ, music producer, professor, avid book reader, and developing salsa dancer. On the show, we love to share the stories of creative professionals, especially people who've gone from the corporate life to the creative life. Once again, welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome to episode 25 of the Amani Experience Podcast. This episode, we have Molly McCauley with us. My favorite two things about this episode is how Molly talked about what she does when she finds herself comparing herself to someone she actually reaches out to them and tries to talk to them get advice or mentorship i love that suggestion great suggestion and the second thing that i really love about our episode was just our discussion on knowing your worth and holding firm with your rates that's a hot topic in the creative space and i love molly's perspective on that thank you very much for listening make sure to subscribe please leave us a rating as well and to the show we go Welcome back to the show. I'm going to read our guest bio for today and then we'll introduce her. Our guest today is a preservation artist. She is a love archivist. She grew up in a family bursting with creatives in a small Midwestern town. She feels fortunate to have been encouraged to design and thrive in the world of fine art with purpose. When visiting her family, you'll find all of them gathered around sipping their beverage of choice. Vodka Glimlet is your choice. So what I would like to do is I'd like to introduce Molly McCauley to the Amani Experience Podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. We're so honored to have you here today. We have two visitors with us, too. Who are our two furry friends with us, <laughs> That's too? That's so funny. They'll, they'll make their presence known, I'm sure, throughout this. <laughs> the big one is Luna. She's a Bernadoodle. And the little one is our rescue. Look at her trying to get up to the mic. Yeah. Um, Baggins and we he is the most recent addition he joined right. us last summer good so we're dog friendly here on the money experience podcast so we we're a fan that's good so <laughs> good. we like them all great <laughs> so we also do a geographical check-in when we have our podcast here so where are we currently right now we are in my home office i guess which is my kitchen table sometimes <laughs> my couch other days um but we are in mar vista so west la west la and where did you grow up I grew up in a very small town in Northeast Wisconsin, uh, Seymour. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So Home you... of the hamburger, shout out. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And then you went off to University of Minnesota for school? I did. Yeah, I went as far away from my hometown <laughs> without paying out-of-state tuition. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So and what was your major there? I actually, they had developed a new um, major in the College of Liberal Arts, and it was an individualized study. So it was a combination of design, retail merchandising, and photography. Nice. Okay, interesting. And then while you were in school, you went away to London for a year? I did. I studied abroad my junior, the spring semester of my junior year. Um, and it was amazing. Still probably my favorite city in the world, itching nice. to go back. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, best experience in my college timeline for sure. Great. And then once you finish school, you then you also maybe, I think it's like three years later, you went to the Brooks Institute of Photography. Yeah. So I moved out to LA actually to help some family out. Um, so I was a live-in nanny and, um, 
was kind of just establishing my feet here in LA. I had no intention of moving to LA originally, so it wasn't somewhere that I thought I would be. Um, Jumped around from a couple different jobs, but then have always kind of been pulled back to photography. And um, in order to pursue that, I was encouraged by my sister to check out Brooks Institute in Santa Barbara. And uh, yeah, I enrolled in their master's program. Right. So and so you got a master's of it's fine arts with yeah. focus in professional photography, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. What was the experience like going there for school? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different podcast. <laughs> no, honestly, their undergraduate, um, sadly, they just closed down um, oh. this last year. It was, um, I believe, purchased by a company so okay. it it transitioned from being a family school to more of a business right. so it's no longer there but um the undergraduate has been known to be like the most prestigious photography school in the nation the master's program was fairly recent i think it had only been around maybe 5 years when i enrolled it was definitely the most challenging educational experience of my life and probably one of the more personal challenges or like most Mm -hmm. more personal challenges that I've um, encountered to dealing with people in the art world. Right. Why would you say it was one of the most challenging academic experiences for you? Well, I've actually never been a great student. I would worked very hard to get average grades. It's so funny. A lot of my friends um, throughout the years have been valedictorians, and I always joke. I knew how to pick my friends because they were the ones I used to copy <laughs> off of. We so, won't tell. I know. Oh, well. But uh, no, they all know now. <laughs> but um, it was funny because I worked really, really hard to be a somewhat average student. So I felt art was one of the areas that I really excelled, but the master's program had a huge emphasis on writing and I have a learning disability where I have a comprehension, um, disability where it's, you know, you'd start a paragraph and by the end of the first or second sentence, I wouldn't remember. I couldn't retain oh. what I'd been reading. So the history and the, the writing Im- uh, implementation was very difficult, but I also had really particular, um, personalities that I was dealing with on the uh, educator side. So it, it was <laughs> That's a PC some, way of some, it. Yeah, so, <laughs> some, uh, some battles okay. um, from week to week. I was definitely the black sheep in my group. Mm, but you survived, you graduated. Yes, it was probably one of my most proud moments. It Good. also was a very proud moment for my family, knowing everything. And I am super excited to say that of the... 12, 13 people that we had left finish, my exhibition was the only exhibition in the program to sell. Well done. Congratulations. Yeah. So it's really exciting. Nice. Nice. So like being a wedding photographer and just a photographer in general, like you have an extremely high level of education, which is cool. That's different for the most, you know, for most part. So how do you feel about that? Um, it's really exciting. I think it's kind of like the ace in my back pocket. Um, I know so many talented self-taught photographers and it's one of those things where art's so subjective that like you can teach yourself. You can, it, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's an easy craft, but it's one that you don't have to attend university or something like that in order to really master it. Um, I'm lucky to have studied under some really great curriculum such as Brooks and actually the University of Minnesota had a state of the art darkroom facility. So the first half of my career in photography was all darkroom, black and white Uh film based. I developed all my own uh, stuff and so on. But um, yeah, I think that it is definitely the ace when it comes to creating that element of trust um, and understanding or educating the, I mean, my clients to, to know that, okay, yeah, there's an artistic component here, but there is also a technical side that I'm very sound on. Good. Yeah. Nice. Impressive. Yeah. So thanks. As, you're welcome. As you're working your way through school, you had different jobs like ticket sales and special events for the gophers. You're a gopher, I'm right? I'm a gopher. Yes. I'm a traitor okay. to my Wisconsin roots. <laughs> That's okay. You know, you're loyal. Stay loyal. So yeah. good. And then you're a coordination, that coordinating assistant here in LA, work yeah. at a gallery. Yeah. And then what I found very interesting is that you started your okay. company and your business in September of 2009, mm-hmm. but you were working a couple of different jobs at the same time. Mm-hmm. So like, how did you balance between your kind of your regular jobs with your growing your company and when you started it? How did you balance that out? Sure. Um, I'm going to be really honest and say I did not take myself seriously for a long time with photography. I was in Santa Barbara getting my master's when my wedding photography business, I guess, 
kind of birthed itself. <laughs> I always say it chose me because I had a friend inquire about me photographing their wedding. Um, I It definitely wasn't something I was seeking out, but I worked in the wedding industry already as an, uh, um, an assistant to a, a, a great creative director here in LA. And um, so I think it actually took me a few years before I really thought oh, hey, I'm a wedding photographer, and this is something that is coming fairly easy to me, um, and maybe I just shouldn't fight it. So my other jobs, I worked at a a winery, like tasting room. I worked for this um, wedding coordinator. Um, When I was in LA, I worked for a gallery. I think I really doubted that I could go photography full time and be solely dependent on that income for such a long time because I didn't have really faith in myself as a businesswoman um, because I had no experience in business. It was really a daunting, um, a daunting thing for me. So I think juggling was always just a part of the act um, (laughs) because I never really considered photography from the get go uh, a thing. Yeah. And not only juggling, but you were also going to school at the same time. So it's like you're doing four things at once. Yeah. And you want to know what? The master's program actually operated on weekends. So what was really fascinating is I would work throughout the week and every other weekend or back to back weekends, just depending on the schedule, I would be in Santa Barbara. And I'd have 10 hour days on Saturday and a 10 hour day on Sunday Mm. in in the classroom, which was long. <laughs> it gets intense. long. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was interesting because every so often working in the wedding industry, I mean, events are on weekends. <laughs> so there would be a weekend here and there that would conf- conflict and I would choose the wedding. And I got a lot of flack for that. Um, and it, it was interesting, but to me it was like, you know, you can be that starving artist, which is what was kind of portrayed what we should be doing. And it's like, or I have this opportunity to be a working artist while I'm also right. advancing my education. Yeah. I'm going to take the job. Yeah. 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 We, got, we got to pay our bills here. We have bills Seriously. to pay. We like nice things sometimes. We, know, we like a lot of <laughs> nice things. <laughs> I understand that you initially had a fashion focus in school yeah. and then you switched to photography. How yes. did that come to be? So I have always, despite what I look like, and it's funny, I think that's kind of a trend in fashion where the designers sometimes can look a little wonky, but I really have an interest in design more so than fashion, but it came through in fashion. And I, and I felt like I always wanted to do fashion photography. So that was where I had told myself I was going. When I moved to LA, like I said, I helped some family out. And after leaving that position, I worked for a custom clothing company. Mm. Um, and I was there for maybe four months before I saw the really dirty side of the fashion industry and knew that I never wanted to be a part of it in that capacity. Um, in terms of photography, maybe down the road, I really love like lifestyle editorial type stuff, but I would never want to be in high fashion side. Okay. Yeah. And when you say the dirty side of like fashion, Mm -hmm. give us an example or trying to share your thoughts on what that means. Um, it's just, it's a cutthroat industry and you see, you just, you just see stuff that you're just like, Oh shoot, they're doing that. And it's like, it's just deceitful. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you just have to have a super thick skin And I was, I was actually, um, with a company that was dressing professional athletes. So it was still in the sports field, which is funny because I have the, um, I worked at Mariucci arena in Minneapolis, which was the athletic department for the university of Minnesota, uh, my entire time, uh, at the university there. And, um, so it was a neat transition to kind of get back into it because I love, I'm from a sports family as well. Um, but it was just dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you play sports growing up? I did. What'd you play? Oh gosh. I dabbled in everything. Everything in my soul wanted to be a football player. And I oh. say my dad was a football coach. Okay. Um, but in seventh grade, my seventh grade history teacher told me I was just too small. I was a really kind of scrawny kid. I was like a bean, like tall, but really skinny. Um, but I was a volleyball player like through half of high school, but I have been golfing since the age of seven. Nice. Um, and that is probably what I excelled in most. I also was a competitive dancer for 15 years. Okay. So golf and dance. So what's your, what's your, what was, what's your best handicap? 
Oh gosh. <laughs> Do you still golf? Um, I I golf really sporadically. Okay. It's not enough. But what's comforting is when I do golf, I'm not. It could be like a year or two since the last time I played, and I'm like not that far off. So it's something Good. that I inherently can kind of pick back up. Um, but I don't know. I would like probably on really good. 18 was like low 80s. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Some people, that's a dream. So yeah. That's great. Yeah, it was great. Not good enough to walk on in college though, because right. it was something I was thinking about oh. and it just wasn't, I, okay. I was, I wasn't there. I think we're going to plan a little golf outing. Molly and Amani are going to go golfing. I Impressive. am down. Competitive dancing. What was the genre or the style of dance? Oh, gosh, everything. So um, you kind of had your mandatory like jazz, tap, ballet. Um, but what I really had uh, strength in was acapella tap. So oh. it was really, really fun. Yeah. But we nice. would compete in national um, competitions throughout the U.S. And um, But acapella tap. Acapella tap. tap was my favorite. Nice. Is, yeah. there, is there some video out there that we can oh, get? Yeah. Ex- okay. Oh, you're not getting any of that video. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to put, put some sleuths on it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Fun facts about Molly. I love yeah. it. Cool. So I understand your mom was an art teacher and a goldsmith. Mm-hmm. How did that affect your career choice? I mean, everything. I think that because there was such an early influence on creativity and the thing that's really great is I, the elementary school that I grew up with, our, um, art teacher was very stifling. It was very, um, regimented and there was no room for creativity. And my mom is the opposite of that. She was always very encouraging to people, um, to express themselves in any way they felt comfortable. Um, she's the kind of person who's going to walk up to somebody and grab their arm when she sees a really great intricate tattoo. Like she just appreciates (laughs) all of it. Um, yeah. So, and we actually grew up with a dark room in our house, in our basement. I did not know this until I was in high school because that's where she hid all of our Christmas presents (laughs) and she didn't want any of us to know, but it, yeah. So between her, my sister also is very creative. She's was an incredible drawer and, um, she does, um, event implementation. She designs events out uh, on the East coast. So we're all kind of in that range and wheelhouse and having them kind of lead the way gave me such confidence to really kind of go for what I'm, what I wanted. Yeah. You're definitely a product of the environment you grew up in. Absolutely. And it's so funny because my household was so different from the overall area of where I grew up because there's not a ton of creative vibes, I guess, in Northeast Wisconsin. I I mean, it's like fact, a lot of factory workers, right. a lot of like, you know, just like blue collar, like it, it's, it wasn't a highlight. So super fortunate that yeah. I grew up in the house that I did. Okay. Now on our show, we always talk to people who have worked somewhat in corporate America and then taken a creative leap. You've mm-hmm. had a couple different jobs where you've worked like for galleries or for the mm-hmm. University of Minnesota. So you've done that as well. Yeah. In your opinion, What's important for creative professionals such as yourself, myself, what's important for us to succeed in today's business environment? I think it's just really being in tune with what works for what you're doing. So for me, I've spent a large, I mean, I'm a photographer, so my, my outlet is Instagram that, you know what I mean? Like that's, I really knew that I needed to invest a lot of time into targeting people through that outlet. Um, like I said, I didn't go to business school. Like this, this has been a long road in like learning what works for me. But I think in order to be successful, the main thing is honestly owning it and just like failing forward and understanding that like you're going to own it and you're just going to go for it regardless of a, how long it takes or like how many stumbles you have along the way, because it takes a while. It does. Especially in, I mean, creatives, it's, it's such a rare thing to kind of just, you know, start and then be like super successful. There's no such thing as an overnight success. No, there's not. There's a picture that I share with people. Oh my gosh. I love that picture. I think I know what it is. What is it? Is it the one with like all the squiggles and up and down, up and down. And it's like all the work. And then as soon as someone notices you, then it's like the skyrocket up. Right. That's one of them, but I'm going to show you another one real quick as you know, and I'll add it to the show notes. So people out there know what we're talking about, but this one is the iceberg here. I love to share this one. So So that one. So that's kind of just what you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, no such thing as overnight success. No. Speaking of that, you started 
you were in school, you started your business 2009. Now you're going on nine years, I would say kind of, you know, more officially. Yeah. When did you realize like, okay, this is going to work. Like this, it's it. Like I'm in both feet. We're going to do this. When was that realization for you? Um, well, I actually have only been solely Molly and Co photography for the last two and a half years coming up on three years. Okay. So I always had a side gig. Like I said, I was terrified to kind of take that leap. So the last three years has been it. And it's just been a growing each year essentially is a growing year. Cause you know, you're, you're not starting from scratch, but it is essentially like, okay, it's a jumping off point. Yes. So, um, gosh, I mean like fairly recent, right? Three years ago, 2000, yeah. early 2015. Yeah. And what was it? What happened when you're like, okay, and now it's time to make, you know, Molly and Company its own entity and just go for it myself? You know, I was working for a really great um, photography company that was well established both here in SoCal and NorCal. And it was such a great learning experience. But I found that I was getting, and it was nothing personal, but I found that I was getting resentful for giving my weekends away to them and not to me. And whether it's my business or my weekend getaway or a trip or whatever it is, or my family, um, it just became, I, I just became like resentful and I didn't like that. And it was more so just a choice to choose me in whatever form that was rather than working for someone else. Good. And three years later, how do we feel about the decision you made? <laughs> really good. I feel really good about it. But like I said, it's, it is almost a jumping off point. So you almost feel as though I felt like I was in 2009 when I was <laughs> starting brand new. Um, so each year has been a growing year of just establishing what my boundaries are, what, you know, what I'm willing to do, what I actually really love to do instead of taking on work just to get the yes. job. Good. We're going to get back to that. Oh, That's yeah. a very good statement there. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Tell us why do you love being a photographer? Oh gosh, I it's so funny because I just had this retreat in Palm Springs last weekend or gosh, a week and a half ago already. And um I I came up with this, I came up I guess with a new tagline um for my business while I was there because it was such a good like mastermind collaborative um brainstorm there. And in a life of fleeting moments, I get to make time stand still. And that's super powerful yes, it and is. it is really in a very selfish way validating like I feel I feel super honored and I feel very excited when I'm chosen to be the person that gets to document this day or the proposal or like whatever and mind you like I take it super seriously I get really nervous <laughs> especially with the proposals like my very first proposal my knees were shaking mm -hmm. for the for this guy <laughs> so um it was you know it's I just take it super seriously and I'm super um, invested in each of the clients that I take on. Okay. And then what is something that scares you? Scares me in... Life, work, <clears throat> whoever you want to, you know, answer. Uh, well, gosh, I think it's like similar for a lot of people where it's like the what if I don't type of thing. And that has been like a huge part of like my mindset training this last kind of year of like focusing more on the abundance of things instead of what I don't have. Um, so that has been a big shift for me, but I honestly think it literally is the, what if I don't become this big dream that I put out there for myself? What if, what if I fail at this? Um, so I, yeah, that's just like the overarching, which I feel like a lot of people struggle right. with. Yeah, definitely. So I read somewhere where you said that when you initially were getting started, like your fear of failure was overwhelming and it prevented mm. you from kind of starting and going for it mm -hmm. at first. What mm -hmm. did you do to kind of fight through that fear and really kind of get through that and start and take that first step? Well, if you ask my parents, the number one word that they've always used um, for me is perseverance. I'm not, I, I've always had a hard time quitting at anything, whether it be like a job, a relationship, <laughs> any of that kind of stuff. I've had a hard time quitting. Um, so for me, it's just really the persistence and perseverance of like dealing through the struggle and dealing with um, whatever comes my way to really, and just handle it, the, handle it as appropriately as I know how and the best I know how, knowing that it's my best right now, you know, and, and 
really just try not to compare um, myself. Yeah. yeah. The comparison trap is tough. So oh, how dang. do you, how do you, especially in the visual world, like when you, and, and honestly, like I really applaud the photographers who do before and afters where they like show their raw f- photo and then they show the edit, like what it takes to get a photo to look like what it is. I haven't done a lot of those, which maybe I will now that I've said it out loud. <laughs> um, but I think it's really impressive because there's just so much that like people don't see and that you know everyone everyone's at a different point so it's like just that just that curve of like mastering your game whether it's like really getting it in camera or you're a pro at photoshop like there's two different approaches really right yeah and so what advice would you have for maybe younger creators or creators who are just starting out that are consistently falling into the comparison trap how would you advise them to get kind of avoid that i would reach out to the people that they're comparing or comparing themselves to okay so the people who i reach out to are people who i either like admire or i'm intimidated by um there are a number of photographers who i've become friends with now because i have admired their work and i'm like half the time it's like, Hey, do you want to meet for coffee? And it's like, can we just like talk about things? And a lot of times it'll be perceived from my end as that they're definitely ahead of the game in me. But when you sit down and do it, like have that conversation, it's like, they'll, they'll compliment me on things. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm good at that. You know? So it's like, it's a little bit, it's reassuring, but it also is like the biggest way that I feel like I've had growth is I'm, I'm also not a shy person. Yes. I'll, no, I'll talk not. to anybody. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's really good advice. Yeah. That's really I mean, good advice. It's, it's the hardest question, but honestly, people are flattered. Like if, if people, you know, and, and, and do something, approach them in a way that it might be like a beneficial, like, or ask if they can be like a mentor or, or like, Hey, can I shadow you or assist you or do something like, you know, like that. Like sometimes coffee isn't an, enough of an, uh, incentive for someone to give an afternoon to somebody, but like follow them, like engage with them on social media, like make your presence known so that when you do reach out to them, it's not like a blind cold right, call. Right. Yeah. Great, great advice. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Let's talk to us about, let's see here, like your favorite failure or how's mm. a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success. Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Mm. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it's funny because it's a personal failure that that, works. L- that led to the best decision of my life. I was in a relationship at a young age, and I was engaged at 19, and that's not abnormal for where I'm from, but it was abnormal for my personality. Um, really, really loved this guy, but I just knew it was too soon and the timing wasn't right. So I cut off a relationship that I was perfectly happy in and uh, moved to London four months later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was such a transformative time, both in like my relationship status, because we had been together nearly four years. Um, All through high school. Well, it was the end of high school through almost my entire college. So spring semester of my junior year, we were like, so it it was a long relationship and a good relationship. Like that's the weird part, right? Is that it all came down to timing in my life. And I don't know what made me second guess it, but it was, I felt as soon as he asked the question that I was like trapped in a way. In the, and I know it sounds awful, um, but I, I felt that way. And I'm the kind of person who can sometimes do something extreme to like, um, I guess associate with that pivot in my life. So I chose to study abroad in London yes. and move there and everything changed. Yeah. That's a serious pivot in life. Yeah, yeah. Big time. And then how did you apply the lessons you learned from that with like the rest of your kind of personal life and then your career kind of moving forward? Well, it's like anything, right? Like, right when you get uncomfortable, like on that edge of that really scary decision, usually comes something really great. Yes. Um, so keeping that in mind, <laughs> um, and trust me, that's a reminder I need to like set for myself True. every so often. We all need reminders. But yeah. So I think, I think just that mentality of knowing as soon as it, it shouldn't be easy it should be simple, but it's like not easy, you know, like it should be, it, it, it should be like, 
interesting and still exciting. And like, you should be challenging yourself, um, in my opinion. So as soon as I get on the edge of like feeling super uncomfortable, I know that I'm kind of doing something right. Yeah, because they say that's where you grow the more is when you're kind of outside your comfort zone. It shouldn't be easy. Yeah. Hmm. I think that might be the title of the episode. I think you might have said that. So good. All right. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) The photography industry, specifically wedding photography, is very crowded. Mm -hmm. What do you do to kind of rise above the noise and distinguish yourself as a photographer? Yeah, especially in Southern California. I mean, it's, it's crazy because... I don't have to be in LA, but my husband's work, we need to be in LA. And I often think about what would my business look like elsewhere? And like, what would it be to be maybe the bigger fish in a smaller pond? Um, So yeah, I mean, it is so saturated and there are so many talented people, um, especially in this area. I would say I really do um, the wedding experience, I think is I don't want to say more important than photos, but it's the experience of working with people, I think will rise above any of the tangible things that they get on the back end. Because you can have the best photo you've ever had in your life, but if the photographer's a jerk, you're going to remember that. Yes. So for me, it's really about <clears throat> setting up a really good experience from that initial consultation or that initial phone call or however we connect all the way through the end to the delivery of their wedding book or wishing them happy anniversary or any of that kind of stuff. So it's really kind of that, that experience. And then also, like I said, I, I use my masters like any, any way that I can. It, it, it definitely sets me apart from, from the people who are, you know, self-taught or just, um, getting out of photo school even. Right, right. Keep yeah. using your master's. Keep yeah, using it. <laughs> it costs me a lot. I'm using it. <laughs> That's right. We got to earn that money back. Tell us about the darkest time of your life. Mm-hmm. How did you get through this or that experience? And what did you learn from that experience? Mm. So it's recent. Yeah. Um, I just lost my dad. And it was in August of last year. Um gosh, how I got through it, through my family and my friends. Um, It was a time, he had a degenerative, um, like genetic disease that we knew that it would, it would be the end eventually, but we just didn't know when. And um, we were lucky to have a number of great years with him. Um, But we, uh, I got married in May Congratulations. Thank Sorry to you. hear about your dad, but congratulations, you. you got married. But I got married in May. My sister got married in August and nice. he passed away a few days after my sister's wedding. Okay. So it was one of, it was losing him, but also having the best experiences of your life and then losing, losing him. It was such a weird year. It was the best year and the worst year of my life. Hmm. So getting through that just with a, a lot of support and honestly, you find out who your friends are. You find out who your family is when you're, when you're struggling with something like that. And it's been shocking, um, in a lot of ways, but I also think that there was such a pride in him when he'd talk about me and my sister that like, if anything, it wants me to do this 10 times more, a hundred times harder, better in any way that I can to validate that. Um, so yeah. Nice. I I know. I know I lost my dad. It was, it's been over 10 years now, but definitely um, I agree with you. You find out kind of who your friends and your family are. You mm-hmm. see some sides of people that you're not used to. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like you got to put one foot forward and just try to keep kind of working forward. But because of that, I'm a DJ and my dad's the one who introduced me to music. Like I'm mm. even more inspired to do That's even the better. Thing. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with what you just said. And it's so funny because I just, I, I schedule out my social media, but I was scheduling out a post that kind of resonated with um, my dad and some experience with um, him. And it's like, I know it sounds weird, but like there are ways that I feel like he injects like himself into my daily life. And like, there are ways that I consciously make sure I'm bringing him along, whether it's like wearing a handkerchief of his or, um, just, there's just so many different little random things that, um, I consciously make the decision to have him with me. Right. Now, was your dad the most influential person for you growing up or was it someone else? I think it was, I honestly am so lucky. I had such a great balance in the, in my house, 
I would say for the creative side of things, definitely my mom, but my dad was such like the sound, like he, I mean, he was the primary provider, um, but he also was just the person who loved being with other people and loved seeing young people thrive. Like he was, he was a football coach. He was a golf coach. He was a high school history teacher. He, he loved seeing young people thrive. If we're going to sit down with 21 year old Molly, I believe you're probably still in Minnesota or maybe just coming back from London. Maybe I turned 21 in London. Nice. So we're going to find you in a cafe in London. Mm, I was in a pub. I wasn't in a (laughs) cafe. Trust me. (laughs) I I got my drinking legs in England. There you go. And so we're going to go to the pub and we're going to give 21 year old Molly some advice based Mm -hmm. on what you know now. What advice would you give yourself as you were a 21 year old? You're not as lost as you think you are. And it's so funny because I got out of this relationship and I went to London and then I met somebody there who I thought was like the thing, right? And it's just like the heartbreak isn't going to be as bad as you think it is. And it's leaving. I left London very devastated in the way that like I didn't want to come home. I just wanted to stay there. Um, So... Just know, just knowing it's, it's not going to be as bad and you're going to have a lot of great things and you will get back. You will get back there. Good. Good advice. What is the one lesson in life that has taken you the longest to learn? Gosh, um, (laughs) which one? (laughs) Pick two if you want. (laughs) Um, you know, I probably would have to say, and this is still a struggle, but it's something I'm very conscious of now, understanding that what people do is their thing. It's not my thing. Not letting, um, other people's actions, words, any of that, um, affect me as personally as I used to. I was very sensitive growing up. Um, and while I was severely bullied for a long time. So like even going into adulthood, understanding that not letting that affect me, that that's somebody else's problem, not my problem. Um, I think that's, the biggest thing that's still a continual, right, but right. yeah. And what have you done so far to really kind of not correct that, but kind of work through that so that doesn't affect you as much? A lot of personal development. Okay. <laughs> that works. <laughs> it works. I've worked with a lot of people. I have business coaches I've Good. worked with. Um, and I actually have this, an amazing, um, Reiki healer here in okay. LA that I've been cool. working with and she's become a pretty, influential person for me, um, Kelsey, and she really kind of just like helps me focus on what's, what's really happening. Nice. Yeah. Reiki here. So she helps you focus. Does she give you specific exercises or yeah, like... she'll do, she does guided meditations, okay. um, which that's something I really struggle with meditating, like sitting still and being quiet is nothing for me. Welcome um, to the club. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, she does guided meditations. She does, um, we would have hour long sessions where I literally would just talk my shit out, you know, just like get it out and like kind of have a brain dump with her. And then she'd either analyze or help, um, transition my focus into like a more productive or enlightened. Yeah. (laughs) Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. I also read where you said that, and I really agree with you, so I want to talk about this. You Mm. see like young photographers who are undervaluing their craft by undercharging. Mm. So the first question in terms of that topic is like, what advice would you give to creatives about, you know, charging proper rates and being strong and knowing their value? Because that's really important. So I want to kind of get your perspective on that. I think it's super important to get experience. And I understand that when you're coming out of photo school or you are just transitioning and you need to build your portfolio, I get it. If you want to do a trade or work for free or whatever, I did plenty of that stuff. And I still do trades where I'll do a collaboration with on a styled shoot that I'm interested in though. Um, so I'm very like particular on what I partake in, but the thing I struggle with is the people who don't have the confidence to charge what they should have and are undercutting themselves because then it's the comparison game. I mean, people are price shopping at the end of the day, right? They want an experience, but they also want the best deal. Um, so for me, it's mostly about educating like the clients on like, okay, you know, like that person might be X, Y, Z cost and, you know, and, and you're going to get 
that experience, but let me tell you what you're getting and the value in what my collections are or whatever that is. So I think the biggest thing is that not only are they undervaluing themselves, but it undervalues the industry. And it kind of sets the tone for people who are like, oh, I'm willing to spend this much on a photographer because that's what I see all these people charging. And because it is such a dense market and there's so many photo and creative, you know, schools that are, you know, pushing these young artists out, everyone's hungry. So it's like, oh yeah, I'll shoot a wedding for $500. By the way, my first wedding, I charged $400. I okay. didn't even know what to ask. They yeah. offered $400 and I was like, yeah, great. Okay. And now though, you'll charge... I'm, I start around the 5,000. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah. Yeah. But I do have an associate program that I'm building. So it's like a small team of people that have worked with me and, and second shot or shot on my behalf when I haven't been able to. And, um, it, it, that's not something that I'm looking to like really expand like in a huge way, but it's in a, in a way that I'm able to still accommodate, um, budgets that I was serving in the past. Um, I still want to be able to have that experience for people, but I'm more on the higher end now in terms of what I'm offering. Yes. As you should be. Yeah. Yeah. Like what advice or how do you work with people when you know that they're like undervaluing themselves and, you know, say they have a slow month coming up and an inquiry kind of comes in. So they're tempted to lower their rates, but like Mm. you have to really stay strong with your values. So how do you kind of do that? And what would you share with people who are looking to improve that part of their business? Sure. Like, especially right now, right? It's February 1st, which I cannot believe. (laughs) Um, But it's a slow season for most people, especially like in the Midwest or East Coast where they're dealing with snow and their wedding season is so condensed. Um, You want to know what? I've I've gotten inquiries for stuff that I don't particularly enjoy shooting, but I used to take on because I was like, oh, well, I don't have a wedding this month or like, you know, any of that stuff. I say no to that now because I'd rather invest my time even like in a styled shoot that is something that's A, going to benefit me or find, you know. I invest my time in kind of reevaluating the collateral that I'm sending to people. Like this is kind of the time that I use to give my face or um, my website or social media or branding or whatever that is, a facelift, you know, like a kind of assess like where I'm at in terms of what I'm offering. Like maybe I'm like going to re re you know, look at my gifting strategy or any of that kind of stuff. I kind of use this downtime now um, because at the end of the day, if I don't enjoy photographing it, I, that money isn't worth it. Agreed. Yeah. So I love your perspective on this. That's why I want to ask you, because we have the same struggles with DJing because, you Mm -hmm. know, people can find someone that'll DJ a wedding for $400, $500. And a DJ is so important. I have to tell you. (laughs) it's very important. They control so much of the timeline too. So understanding and having a DJ that works well with not just the couple, but the other people in the industry and the other vendors, like I have a, I have a 10 minute window sometimes for sunset. And if a DJ decides to do the first dance at that point, it's done, you know? So it's like just being communicative and on point with the other vendors is so yeah. important. Just collaborative, you yeah. know, it's not about them. It's about not only the couple, but you want to set your vendors Everything. and your partners up for success. So yeah. that when you have the last hour, when everyone's done, right. then you can play the song and it's totally. all about that. But it, so many people don't get that. Yeah. So I love your perspective. A lot of our peers that know you really respect the way that you, pers- you know, kind of follow your pricing. So, you know, people are looking at you. Oh. you know, so that's good. That's oh, very that's good, good feedback. So keep it up <laughs> because um, I think you're setting a really good example. So please stick with it. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. You're welcome. Every great person has a sentence. What is your sentence? My sentence would be, I love for pe- to help people unlock their creativity by sharing with them how to DJ. Fun. What is your sentence? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think I might've said it earlier where I said, you know, like it's something that's really resonating with me right now that like, especially after the loss of my dad, understanding how important preservation is. I think we are in such a digital age where no one's printing their photos anymore. It's all living in a cloud and that drives me bonkers. (laughs) So, um, understanding the importance and really just kind of like, I guess, educating people on the importance of preservation so that you have these things to share with generations to come. Because, you know, like I said, in a, in a world of fleeting moments, like I have this opportunity that, you know, 
causes me to be able to stop time for a minute. And that's like, that's a, a big deal and a, and a huge honor too. Right. Yeah. Good. So like I read a quote where you say, invest in your photography, print the photos, please print the photos. So I'm yeah. assuming that might be your sentence. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. And I actually think that that was on a personal blog post right after I lost my yeah, dad. It was. Um, because it was one of those things where w my sister's photographers were incredible. The experience they provided on that day was incredible. They were so quick to get her a sneak peek because we knew my dad wasn't doing so great. They got her photos the day before he passed away. Wow. And it was so important for her to have that moment and have the, that sneak peek before he was gone because that is, that is like something that is just really powerful. Um, but also it's just like, now that's it, right? Yeah. So now we're talking about making our wedding albums and like what we're going to include and what, you know, it, it's so much more meaningful. So please print your photos. <laughs> Excellent sentence. I know. Very unique. What is one new habit, or it could be two new habits, that you've added to your daily routine in the past year or so that has been most beneficial? Okay, so I've been following on recommendation from uh, a few other entrepreneurs here in, um, on the West Side that I've been collaborating with through rising tide society um i've been following the being boss gals okay yeah and they talk about the chalkboard method okay and that is a new thing that i've implemented for 2018 so essentially it's making the visuals of um and they break it down into quarters so they'll do a chalkboard method per quarter um i did kind of a combination of like what i wanted to do in the quarter but over overall as well so in terms of having a visual of where like where i'm at and what else i need to do i'm a very obviously a visual person so it makes things so much more tangible and more um attainable almost by seeing oh i only have five more weddings that i can book this year like that's cool yeah you know and i want three destination weddings and I already have one booked. So it's like, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a fun, um, thing for especially people who are visual, um, to be able to have that one glance and okay. be implementing that. Cool. Yeah. The chalkboard method. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll link to that. So yeah, good. for sure. You spoke about destination weddings. Mm -hmm. I saw the list of your kind of top 10 yeah. where you want to go. So I've been on an African safari. Oh my God. I highly recommend that. Ugh. That would be a cool destination wedding. I know there's just so many cool places. And honestly, like I much like wedding photography in general, the desti destination thing kind of came out of left field for me. Um, it was just friends that were in different places. Um, my best friend got married to a Frenchman and got married in, in France. Um, I had another friend refer me to a friend in Switzerland and I've, yes. I've been really, really lucky, um, to be able to make it because travel's always been right. a, a big, thing for me and a passion of mine it's really fun to be able to implement that within work yeah so i'm looking into the future i'm sensing we're going to have a golf outing coming uh -huh. up and then like a destination wedding like i'll sure go do thing. the african safari also you mentioned the maldives we can do Anywhere, that yeah. or greece like those are top top three for me so yeah we got some work to do i know <laughs> i'm on board cool only my experience podcast we love to talk about books. Mm -hmm. So what's one, two or three books that you would recommend people stop what they're doing right now and start to read them right away? I'm the worst. <laughs> because of my reading disability, okay. I find books to be very challenging and um, daunting and I'm not going to pick up a book, especially if it's like huge or whatever. Right. I'm much more into podcasts. I'm much more into audiobooks. Okay. So I will listen to yeah. an audiobook before I would purchase a book. For sure. Audiobook. Um, yeah. What, which ones would you recommend? I love audiobooks. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I just finished, finished, um, Tina Fey's. Okay. Which yes. is good. Yes. I've read um, that. Good. Yeah. Um, but I'm just starting Jen Sincero's, uh, okay. You Are a Badass. Good book. Yes. Yeah. I've listened to that one too. Good. Okay, cool. Yeah. Ooh, good Plus choices. I can listen while I'm editing. It just yes. makes it a lot easier. Nice. Here. You mentioned podcasts. What are some of your favorite podcasts to listen to? Oh, so right now, most of them are focused on business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I like being boss. I like um, Jenna Kutcher's Gold Digger. She's a Wisconsin girl. Um, Very and, true. Yeah. yeah. And the Influencer Podcast. And that's more um, in line with the people 
who I'm working with for my photography program. I work with a lot of social media influencers and bloggers. So I offer a specific program for them to okay. create um, continuous content uh, for their social media channels and the, um, particular stories. So um, I'm listening to the influencer podcast right yeah. now because she touches on a lot of strategy there. Good. Okay. Yeah. Tell people how they can reach you and find you online. Yeah. <laughs> um, website is www.mollyandco.com. Instagram is at mollycophoto. Um, yeah. So those are the best ways to reach me. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then where do you spend most of your time online? Instagram. Instagram. All day long. So all day. Instagram it stories too? Yeah. Instagram stories all day. Um, I... It's, it's actually funny. <laughs> I think my husband, whenever he sees me on my phone, he assumes that I'm on Instagram. Sometimes I'm checking emails and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, Instagram stories all day long. Cool. And then I understand that you have a love for the color green and bunnies. Explain that to oh, us. Goodness. As well as buttered popcorn with salt. <laughs> it, okay. So, you know, like that one, that one item that, you know, if you had to choose one thing to eat for the rest of your life, it would definitely be popcorn. I, can, I easily have had that for many meals throughout my life. Um, but yeah, color green, I don't know if it's even something specific. It's since I was young, um, which is funny because I grew up in a yellow bedroom, but green was my color. Um, and bunnies, my, my sister was assigned bears as a kid. <laughs> and when I came along, it's like, okay, she can't have a bear. She needs to have her own animal. So it's been bunnies and it's been bunnies my whole life. Um, and they show up. They, I don't know if you've actually noticed there's one up there. Oh, there it is. There's one over in the corner oh. over there. The upholstery on that chair is bunnies. <laughs> it's at, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, it's been a pleasure to have you Thank on the show. You. I really respect the work you're doing. I'm so glad Thanks. we met through Rising Tides. I know. And um, I just really you know, like your perspective on business and also the fact that you have your brand camp and all that. So, I know, um, that's new. Yeah, you want to tell us really quickly about that? Yeah, so it actually is um, targeted to female entrepreneurs who are really just looking to up-level um, their business. And it could be someone who, A, is shifting from corporate into a creative space or into something that they're really hoping to make into a business. Or it could just be someone who's ready to go from beginner to, you know, pro. Um, so it really focuses on the branding of your business, especially since so many creatives are the face of their business. Right. My expertise and what I bring to brand camp is the importance of having photography and having photos of yourself that you love and that you share with people. Because I looked at my top nine for 2017 and seven of the nine were personal photos of myself yeah. and that blew me away. So it just speaks to the audience wanting to know who you are. So that's the element that I bring. We have um, success coaches that we um, have brought on. The Re We brought my girl, yes. Kelsey, the Reiki cool. master, and my partner, Rebecca, who is a crazy business strategist and amazing. So that's brand camp brand camp retreat yeah, tongue twister yeah i know cool so that's how they find it the yes. website cool yeah and the next one's going to be this fall in sonoma it's a traveling uh oh, retreat impressive yeah congrats on that thank you so as we leave the show mm -hmm. we always like to let our guests give any last minute words of wisdom or advice so i'll kind of let you do that but thank you so much i'm looking forward yeah. to working with you in the future and continue to get to know you because um it's been a pleasure interviewing you and i love to watch like the progress of your business and i respect your perspective on pricing and your education so just keep doing it Thanks. So proud. So what advice would you leave with us as we leave the show? Sure. I would just say whatever that thing that is tugging at you, try to figure out how you can make that into your air quotes work. Um, it, it's, it's one thing to like have a hobby, but if you can make that passion into your job, it, it's like the easiest and best job in the world. So that's why, you know, when people say, you know, if you find something you really love, you're not working a day in your life, obviously there's hard work that goes into it, but it's so much more rewarding and enjoyable. So find the thing that is really like tugging at your heartstrings and figure out how you can, you know, make the most of that. Excellent. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right, bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Amani Experience Podcast. You can check out the show notes on amaniexperience.com slash podcast. 
please remember to leave us a review on the platform you are listening on and share this podcast with anyone who you feel would benefit from listening. See you soon on our next episode.